Good morning, church. Trying something new this morning, sitting on that side. <laughs> it's kind of cool. It's, it's, it's a whole different perspective. <laughs> so pastor today is going to be talking about works and faith. And um, one of the verses that he'll quote is, faith without works is dead. And one of the things that I've often said is, um, you, you know that you're walking with the Lord if you wake up in the morning and you ask him, what can I do for you? And this first service this morning, I was uh, kind of an emotional wreck, and I, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that when we're called to do God's work, you got to kind of wonder, why would he call us? You know, what makes us so special? And, um, and I think that, you know, we don't see ourselves as God sees us, and we're all special in his eyes, but we're also given, we're given a mission. And we're supposed to um, go out and do his, his will, you know, do his work. We are his hands and feet. So um, it's good that we remember or that we're reminded of that um, through scripture. So I just want to uh, let you all know that I'm here because God says I should be here. <laughs> and I don't care what any of you say. <laughs> no, I do care what you say. <laughs> Anyway, let's pray. Dear Father God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for each person that's here. Lord, we just ask that you have your way in the service today, that the message that pastor brings will be one that we can apply to our lives and that we can share with others. Lord, we pray your blessings over the tithes and offerings that are being given and ask that they be used to increase your kingdom. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and unable to be with us today. We pray for their healing. And Lord, we pray that um, that you will grant us your peace as we go through this day and through the upcoming week. And we ask that, that everything, or we hope that everything that we say and do will in all ways honor and glorify you. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning to each one of you. Join us, please, as we sing this morning, I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs>
uh, if you know much about Dave Thomas, but I'm sure you know about his business. Dave Thomas started the Wendy's restaurants, named it after his daughter, and uh, ended up having thousands of restaurants across the country, including Austin at one time. He was a follower of Jesus, and he made it known. He was respected as a man of integrity and hardworking with down-to-earth values. And in his book called Well Done, as in hamburger, Thomas said that believers should be roll-up-your-sleeves Christians. What picture does that put in your mind? Hardworking action. Uh, people who, who value Bible reading and, and uh, prayer, but also uh, involvement, being part of a church, being part of ministry, faith and action. And he talked about it and he practiced it. He worked hard in his business and he worked hard in his faith. If you're reading through the New Testament with us, how many are still working on that? Good, good for you. We came to the book of James and uh, James was a brother of Jesus. You know, Mary and Joseph were mar married, but Jesus was already on the way. His, his father was God. Uh, he, was, he was implanted in Mary through the Holy Spirit. He was, he was all God and he was all man at the same time. Well, Mary and Joseph, in the course of things, had four sons. Their names are given in the book of Mark. It also mentions that he had sisters. So we know there are at least two. And James was one of those, half-brothers. And he grew up with Jesus and uh, didn't believe in him when he began his ministry. Uh, he nor his brothers. Of course, their mom did. She knew. And I'm sure they talked. But he wasn't convinced until he saw Jesus risen from the dead. And he became an instant believer. And his brothers, they all got involved in the Christian church, the Jerusalem church at that time. And James became the leader there. He wrote this book about 15 or 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So it's one of the first parts of the New Testament that God gave us. And James uh, wanted us to know how to live the life God called us to. The book of James is an instruction manual. This is what it means to follow Jesus. There's 108 verses in the book and 59 of them are commands, imperative, do this, stop that, get going. He's, in, he's telling us it's instructions, what to do. And he may have, James may have agreed with this statement somebody made, think like a person of action and act like a person of thought. Sometimes we think and think, but we don't get around to doing, and that's no good. Sometimes we do something, we think, oh, I didn't think that through, right? We do both, but we need to do both together, and uh, we can. This is a short letter, but it em emphasizes the importance of doing. Do it. The Bible is very helpful in all areas of life. It talks to us about managing our thoughts. It says, take captive every thought to obedience to Christ. Be careful what you think about. Be careful what you brood on. It also talks to us about our words. They're powerful. Jesus even said, you'll be judged by every useless word you've spoken. That's scary, isn't it? He also said, your sins can be forgiven. But James focuses on the action part. And so we need to pay attention to him as well. The Bible says all of our life will change when Jesus is in charge. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. The Bible calls it being born again. I'm physically here, now I want to become part of God's family. Now I want to come spiritually alive. Now I want to be the full person God made me to be. And when we let that happen, everything changes, makes a difference. The Bible's clear. Well, before we move on and talk about more of that, let's pause and talk to God one more time today. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're real, that you rose from the dead, you're alive today, you're working in the world, and you're working in us. We thank you for your word, that it's true, that it's powerful, that when we apply it in our lives, it makes a difference. And so we pray that we'll have ears to hear and eyes to see and a will to obey all that you have to say this morning. Amen. Now the Bible makes it very clear we don't get right with God by what we do. We don't have a certain amount of things to do. Someone told me in the early service, a relative of theirs is dying, and she said, I hope my good outweighs my bad. It doesn't. It never does. You can't you can't outweigh your bad. You can't undo your bad. Bad is um, bad. One bad thing is enough, and we've got a lot more than that to deal with. The Bible says He saved us not by righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. We're not when we leave this world. We're not so much going to go to a reward, although that is true. But first, we're going to go to receive mercy. God is going to welcome us to heaven even though we don't deserve it. He's not going to say, man, I've been, you're the best I've had yet. not going to say that to me. We don't focus on doing good in order to be saved. We never could. We can't cancel our sins by doing something good. If I, if I uh, hurt you in some way, I, I can't uh, give you a present and call it even. I need to humble myself and apologize and ask forgiveness. And that's how it is with God. We have to ask forgiveness. And it only can be given to us because of Jesus. He'll forgive us. God will forgive us based on what Jesus did on the cross. It's that time of year now where a week from Friday will be Good Friday. And we remember what it cost Jesus to save us. If you've never watched that old movie, it's probably 20 years old now, The Passion of the Christ. Watch it. It's hard to watch. But we need to be reminded from time to time that Jesus really did pay a price to be our Savior. And it really does matter. It really does change things. It really does change us when we open up and say, Jesus, you love me that much? Take charge of my life. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Nobody's going to walk around heaven saying, you know what I did to get here? Nobody's going to have their name on some plaque that they're outstanding. We're all going to say, isn't he good? Isn't Jesus good? He gave this to us. James uh, in no way contradicts the idea that we're saved by grace, not by works. We can only ask for it. We can only gratefully accept it. But he also tells us that once Jesus comes in, we'll want to respond. We'll have a gratitude that says, I want to love you back. I want to, I want to be yours. I want to be available for what you're doing. I want to be part of your plan. And we were made for that. Do, do you feel good when you do something good? It just feels good, doesn't it? It's like I'm alive. I matter. We were made for that. Everybody was. We're made in the image of God. He only does good. People who don't believe in God still feel good doing good. It's built in us. But it was built in us to to do in cooperation with God as his children. And so the Bible even tells us, and we've seen this a few times lately, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before you were born, God had things in mind for you to do. He had people that you would touch. He had ways that you would serve. He gave you a certain personality, a predisposition, certain gifts and interests. Some of you know you were born to be musical. Some of you know you were born to be athletic. 
Some of you know you were born uh, to, to minister to children. You were born to care for people uh, in a medical way. You were born to, to cook. I don't know. But you come alive when you do it. You know you're doing it for God. You know he's pleased because he created us in Christ Jesus. Now, what that means is he not only created me physically, that I was born, but he gave me new birth as I believed in Jesus. I was born again. I, got, I stepped into a new dimension of life. I was alive physically. Now I've come alive spiritually. I'm in touch with my father, and he's working his will in me. And he gave me things to do that he thought of even before they came into my mind. And it's good to do. And James is writing to people who have begun following Jesus and are working along the life, and he urges them, cooperate fully with God. Do everything he created you to do. Don't have a casual attitude uh, towards God's commands, but take them seriously. Don't ignore anything he says, but do it. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. I can hear it, without doing it, and it just isn't what God wants. He's repeating something Jesus said. This is a, a pretty long passage, but let's, let's look at it together. Not everyone who calls me their Lord, Jesus is speaking, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only the ones who obey my Father in heaven will get in. On the day of judgment, many will call me their Lord. They will say, in another translation, they will say, Lord, Lord, we preached in your name, and in your name we forced out demons and worked many miracles. But I will tell them, I will have nothing to do with you. Get out of my sight, you evil doers. What? Were the miracles evil? Was casting out a demon evil? No, but they were double-minded. They were, they were doing some things God's way, but they were doing evil too. They were doing their own thing. They were in it for themselves. They were not, they didn't connect with Jesus. They didn't call on him. They're proud of what they did. They're not thankful for what he did through them. See the difference? It's still about them. And you can't go to heaven and have it be about you. It won't work. God won't allow you in if it's going to be about you. Because we tried that in this world, and how's it turning out? And so God says, no, when you come to me, it has to be about me. It has to be about my purpose. And so he goes on. Anyone who hears and obeys these teachings of mine is like a wise person who built a house on solid rock. Rain poured down, rivers flooded, and winds beat against that house, but it was built on solid rock, and so it did not fall. I, I saw a picture this week of a monastery in Turkey built right on this steep, upright cliff. It was hundreds of feet up from the floor below, and it was built into the, into the side, into the rock, and it was a 1,000 years old. Been there all this time because it's based on the rock. There are buildings in the world that are 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old. The Parthenon in Greece goes back to the time of Christ, and it's still standing. The pillars are still there. It, it's built on solid rock. Nothing's going to sink or move. Even an earthquake hasn't been able to make it move. And God wants us to have a foundation that won't give way, that won't wear out, that won't fail us. And the truth is, the truth is the foundation. What he tells us. When you read it in the Bible and God says to do it, you can do it and it will turn out for your benefit. It might hurt. It might be a sacrifice. It might be opposed. You might get fired for it. But you'll be glad you did it. And God will be glad you did it. And it will be good. Jesus and James are both telling us, take an honest look at yourself. What you call faith, is it faith? Is it real faith? Or is it some kind of false faith or some kind of partial faith? If we have true faith, it'll express itself in good works. 
It's eager to do God's will. Faith is eager. God, what, what's, what's next? And if we really believe it, it will show in our actions. James talks about people who say, well, I believe in God. Anybody ever told you that? Well, I believe in God. James says, big deal. That's not the kind of believers God is looking for. He's looking for believers who don't just have mental knowledge or mental agreement. He's looking for people who pull into God, who make themselves available to God, who say, God, I want you in me, and I want you to do things through me. He gets a little sarcastic. He talks about demons. Demons know about God. They know he's real. They know he's powerful. They know he's the creator. They know they have to answer to him. And so James writes, you believe that God is one? Oh, you're doing fine. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. He says, if you know that and you don't act on it, it should scare you to death. Because you don't have an excuse. And the demons know they don't have a great future. Once in a while I remember that poster. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. That's a little bit bratty, but true. God expects more than mental agreement. Jesus says, follow me. Obey me. He once turned to some people. They kept coming to hear him teach. And he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I say? Why do you call me boss and then not do what I told you? Good answer to that? I haven't thought of one. He's had to say it to me. <laughs> the answer is, I'm sorry. We're not saved by doing good works, we know that, but we're not saved by a passive faith. We need an obedient faith. Whenever faith arrives, good works are gonna follow. A faith that doesn't change anything isn't worth anything. Is that true? It has to make a difference or it's not really faith. It's an idea that looks interesting or even agreeable, but if there's no action, it's not faith. Faith is reflected by doing what God says. So James essentially demands, don't tell me about your faith, show it to me. And then he solemnly concludes that paragraph, faith without works is what? It's dead, it's useless, it's unproductive, it's unfruitful, it's an illusion, it's not real. And so he gives us some practical ways to apply this. We'll just look at some practical ways that faith shows up in the life of a believer. Number one is rejoice in trials. Rejoice in what? A few years ago in March, we had a real uh, fast snow melt and the ground was really soft and someone came to church, she was probably 90 years old, and she pulled in and parked on the parking lot and her tires went off the blacktop onto the grass, but it wasn't hard enough to hold the car and her car sank until the frame was on the pavement. Was she supposed to be happy about that? Uh, maybe it could have been pouring down rain too. A March rain. Uh, all kinds of things happen to you, right? Your dog gets run over, you, you gotta have surgery, you, someone steals something precious to you, you lose a friend or a job. No, he's not saying be glad that it hurts. He's saying be glad that God is there. When we fret over our troubles, it stirs up anger, stirs up resentment, stirs up bitterness, stirs up self-pity, unforgiveness, all kinds of stuff. And all of it leads to more sin. 
So James says, don't do that. He says, consider yourselves fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. And he goes on to explain, do you want to be mature in the Lord? Do you want to be complete in your faith? This is going to take you towards that. This is the next step towards that. Stop and think about the miracles Jesus did. They almost all, maybe all, started with a problem. This guy can't see. This guy can't walk. We got 5,000 people here that are hungry and no food. Miracles, the first step is a problem. Growth, the first step is often a problem. And God says, I'm going to give you an opportunity now to really trust me. You could trust me when the paychecks were coming in regularly. Can you trust me now? When I took care of you that way, is it okay if I take care of you another way? Will you trust me? Right? And sometimes you step out and do it. One of our men uh, resigned from a job because he believes... That's not where God wants me anymore, and he will take care of me. That's called believing, really believing. And you and I are called to do that. Number two, overcome temptation. He doesn't say enjoy it. He doesn't say uh, anything. It's just, it's going to happen. We'll face temptations, and the reason they're temptations, they appeal to us. I've never been tempted to go into someone's garden and steal an onion. Just don't like them. My dad ate onion sandwiches. I thought he was nuts. Someone told me yesterday that uh, they had an aunt who was mentally unstable but took care of them after school. And the mother said, just don't get her upset. Just do what she tells you. And the aunt made her an onion sandwich, big thick slab of onion. And she forced that thing down because <laughs> she was obeying her mother. And I thought, you poor child. She said, the tears were running. But I, I'm not tempted to steal an onion, but I might be tempted to steal your watermelon. <laughs> Sixth grade. When you thump it with your finger and it gives a hollow sound like summer rain a falling on a dry and dusty ground, then get your jackknife ready and prepare to make a swipe and carve it straight and steady till it opens red and ripe. I don't know why I learned that. but <laughs> There's one. Don't be doers. Don't be doers. No, temptation, the Bible tells us. Everyone is tempted by his own desires. Everyone is tempted by their own desires. We had a person in the House of Representatives a few years ago when the, we were trying to decide should, should, should people who are same gender be allowed to be married? And he said, how many gay people does God have to make until we treat them better? God doesn't make people gay. I know people are born with predispositions, but God doesn't do that. Some people are born liking to light fires or break things. Almost every boy likes breaking things. You know what? Not God. Not God. A few get a job where they get to do that. I watched the guy tear down the house on the corner Uh, a few years ago. He was good at it. He enjoyed it. He said, I love this job. (laughs) It was okay. It was constructive. But what I'm saying is temptation. The Bible says God is not tempted. He does not tempt anybody. Don't blame a temptation on God. That's from the devil. God will test you. A test is designed to be passed. If it, when, I had a, when I was a school teacher, if I had a test and uh, uh, all the kids did poorly, it was a bad test. I did a bad job making that test. I hadn't prepared them for it. The test was designed to be passed. Almost everybody, if not everybody, should pass it. And some should do very well, and some should do pretty well. 
because that's what a test is for, is to say, you've learned something, now let's see if you can show it. A de temptation is, is designed to destroy you. The devil came to kill, steal, and destroy, and temptation is his way of taking you out of God's blessing and into his grip. He'll promise you happiness. Man, if you could get that money, you'd be pretty set up. You'd be happy. Think of what you could do. That is not going to be a way to God's blessing, is it? It will destroy your life. It will corrupt your character. It will threaten your soul. And so a temptation is not from God, it's from the devil. And so he tells us you can resist it. You can stay away from it. Bible, of, of all the things the Bible says to do about temptation, it says flee. Not the animal, the action. Get out of there. There's places you ought not to be. There's people you ought to say, I got to go home now. Flee from temptation. Last book, chapter of James, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Quote scripture. Start praising God. Turn on good music. Pray. He will flee. He hates when you worship. Third one is treat people kindly. Be ready to hear more than talk. Everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's one thing I'm glad I always do. That was a joke. Boy, we need this in our dialogue in our country, don't we? We need this in the church. We need this in our homes. Quick to listen. I, I'm, I'm not getting that. I don't think I agree with it, but tell me, tell me something. Slow to speak. Sometimes when it's a, a heated a little bit or it's a direct d difference, Sometimes it helps to say, is it okay if I tell you what I think? Is it okay if I tell you something the Bible says about that? Because now you're not just jumping in and giving it to them. You're saying, I, I have something I think will be helpful if you want to hear it. And slow to become angry. Oh, man, I wish I'd have done that better as a dad, as a teacher, all, all ways of life. I wish I'd have been a lot slower to anger. There's a place for anger. We may even be judged for not being angry at some things. Human trafficking, fentanyl, should make you just burn. But slow to anger. Be angry and yet don't sin, the Bible says. Well, let's go to the fourth one. Uh, what this does, what we just talked about is it makes us more tender. It makes us more Christ-like. And we get the, how do you do that? Get into the word. He says, be teachable. Go to the word. Let it speak to you. Let it guide you. The word of God will help you. And the, that was chapter one of James. Got three more from chapter two. Treat everyone with love and respect. Don't show favoritism. He explains, if you have someone coming into the church who's wealthy, and you come in, someone comes in who's clearly poor, treat them the same. Sir, sit anywhere you want. Sir, sit anywhere you want. Sir, join us for the potluck. Sir, we care about you. Is there anything we can pray for you about? That's what churches are meant to be like. That's what we're meant to be like. That's what we need to shoot for. And if we fall short, we need to repent and do better. We have to treat people, not according to their outward circumstances, but because they're made in the image of God. This person comes in who's obviously a sinner. It's just, you can tell. Or maybe they have a reputation. And you know they're a champion at drinking. Treat them with respect. Treat them with love. We have a little food shelf in our church. It's just a little cupboard. It's not much bigger than the communion table, but we, people keep bringing it and we keep giving it. Anybody who asks for food, we'll give it to them. We may know instantly we don't approve of their life, 
we know, may know instantly by their language they don't think much about God. But we help them because they need help. And God loves them. And we'll give a gas voucher to someone. And uh, sometimes they lie to us. We'd rather, we'd rather be fooled than be unkind. And so that's what we do. Now we aren't a dole where you come every week. Salvation Army does that and we're thankful we help them. But we, we show kindness and love the best we can as a body and hopefully as individuals because everyone deserves to be loved. Here's God's standard. Love your neighbor, right? Here's God's standard. Love all your neighbors. Love all your neighbors. Oh God, you don't know my neighbor. He says, oh, I do. And I know why they're like that. I know what went wrong. And I'll tell you what they need. Love and kindness and respect. Guy bought a house and moved in. The day he moved in, a neighbor came over. You bought this house? He said, yeah. He said, well, you're going to get a lawsuit tomorrow. He said, what for? That fence. He said, that fence over there is six feet onto my side of the line. And the guy said, oh, well, I'll call tomorrow and have it moved. His neighbor said, oh, no, you won't. Leave it. Kindness and respect work better than saying, well, I got a better lawyer than you. My lawyer can beat up your lawyer. <laughs> should you always give in? I don't think so, but should you to listen to the Spirit of God? Always, always. Number five, obey most of God's commands. Some of us would feel like I'm making a lot of progress if I did most, right? But the Bible says obey all. Why? Everything God says matters. Everything God says he means. James says whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. I don't get that. Yeah, I stole a candy bar, but should I go commit adultery and it's the same thing? He's not saying that. He's saying when you disobey God, it will break off your connection, your relationship. Think of a chain. Here's the Ten Commandments, ten links. What happens to whatever's hanging on it if I break one link? He says if you break one link, the result is no different than if you broke all ten. Whatever you trusted to be held by that chain is crashing. And in this case, he's talking about your relationship to God. He's not talking about earning salvation. He's talking about being in fellowship, being on talking terms, being close to your Father, being right in every way. And you can't do it if you say, well, this command doesn't matter. I don't care about that one. I need to do this. So don't do it. They're all serious. Don't disregard any. Now, if you are a believer in Jesus and you sin, you don't stop being his child, but you are a problem child. And you know what happens to problem children? They get more problems. I remember making an assignment saying you need to do this by Friday, and a kid said, what if I don't do it? I said, well, I'll be unhappy, and I'll think of a way to make you even more unhappy. <laughs> why? Because I'm supposed to be training him. That's why. And God says, I'm your father. I won't overlook sin. I won't, be, I won't retreat. I won't stop loving. But I won't stop being righteous. I will be righteous. I won't be satisfied when you're not. Number six, give real help. Everybody needs help. We all need help. That day that uh, uh, the, the lady get, went into the mud and her car was down, uh, the guys in the church helped her. 
but they couldn't get in front and lift it, so I think they called a tow truck, but they, they stayed with her and they, they made sure it was done and they got her back home just fine because we all need help. And they didn't just say, well, good luck with that. <laughs> and he says in here, he's talking about fellow believers particularly, so let's look at this scripture. Suppose a brother or sister needs clothes or food and one of you tells that person, God be with you, stay warm, and make sure you eat enough. If you don't provide what that person needs, that physical needs, what good does that do? For a lot of my life, <clears throat> I could help you a little bit, but I was usually living check to check. You know, we all do. But God, is, and as I've gotten older and I've paid off a house and some things, I, I can do more and I find God wants me to do more. And he says to us, give real help, not just lip service, not just empty words. Be there. Be there. There's all kinds of ways to do it, aren't there? Well, James gives all kinds of other ways that our faith applies. He shows us how everyday situations are an opportunity to step into what God is doing. And he shows us how to be the salt of the world, the, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. He shows us how to make life better for people because we follow Jesus. Well, let me give you an example from uh, somebody's every week life. Uh, a garbage collector in Kentucky noticed one of the elderly ladies didn't put her garbage can out two weeks in a row. And uh, he knew her, he'd seen her, they, you know, they weren't best friends, but he was concerned, he knew she was older and lived alone. He went into the office, told the, the gal there, and the gal said, I'll call her. She did. Mrs. Smith, we've noticed your can hasn't been out for two weeks, are you okay? Yeah, I'm doing okay, but uh, I don't have any garbage because I'm running out of food. My caretaker isn't coming anymore, and I can't get out, and I'm running low on food, and I, I don't have any family to help me. And the gal said, you do now. The next day was the driver's day off. And he went and knocked on the door. Mrs. Smith, I'm, I'm your garbage guy. And I just came to get you some groceries. Could you make me a list so I can get what you need? So she wrote a few things down. He said, Mrs. Smith, this is too short. Give me a list. She wrote a couple more things. Mrs. Smith, would you be offended if I looked in your fridge? She stepped back. It was empty. I'll be back in an hour. He showed up with all these bags of food. Mrs. Smith could hardly walk, but her spirit was flying. Mrs. Smith knew the meaning of loneliness, but that day she felt love straight from heaven. God touched her. And how'd that guy feel on his way home? He even was nicer to his dog because he just wanted to keep it going. That's God's will. That's what we're made for. Now, that's doing good matters. Doing it for God is what we're made for. Someone suggested to me after the first service, James says faith without works is dead. But could we say that works without faith is dead? And it can be, can it? It can be just about generating a good feeling or being important or, or um, looking good to others. It can be about us. But when it's about Jesus, it's alive. It does more good than the food on the table. It 
puts something into a person's life. It brings them alive. It gives them hope. It, it draws them to God. So let's cultivate a faith that really works. Let's show up for duty. God, I'll do what you tell me today. And let's live at the level God made us for. How do you feel about that? Anybody want to give it a shot this week? I want to walk with you, Jesus. And I want someone to be blessed because I do. Let's close with a song.
By the way, uh, James had a nickname. They called him Camel Knees. Never really looked at camel knees, but his were all uh, thick with skin, calloused almost, you know, because he prayed so much. They said that about John Wesley. He lived in a certain place. They said there was a spot next to his bed that was hollowed out just a hair because he knelt there every night. 